Back in December, rounding the Cape of Good Hope, Kidd met up with a squadron of five ships under Commander Thomas Warren, RN. Warren had lost over 300 of his men and demanded that Kidd offer up about 30 of his. Not keen on losing a second bunch of men to the Navy, Kidd took advantage of a calm night and rowed the adventure galley off over the horizon. Roll like hell, boys! We'll lose them yet! It was an action that would cost him far more than 30 men. Commander Warren used the incident to blacken Kidd's name, putting into Cape Town and telling everyone he met that Kidd was a pirate and not a pirate hunter. The man was a barnpot. Old wagon, no brain. Caused you a lot of trouble, then. His wee stories closed down every friendly port to us. Thanks to him, we were out on our own. I thought everyone thought you were a pirate, then. You have it in one, sir. But I was no pirate. The problem for Kidd was that the Indian moguls, along with a bit of help from the French and the Dutch, had got it into their heads that the English East India Company was responsible for piracy in the Indian Ocean, making life a bit difficult for our empire builders. But at the time, despite the rumours, Captain Kidd was what he said he was, one of the good guys, a pirate hunter. However, after four months at sea, his crew were looking for the prize money that they'd been promised, and there were some who were in danger of forgetting whose side they were meant to be on. Not but a wet desert every day and every night. It's a lily livid bastard, this one. We're not going to make any money out of him, that's for sure. Then, at the end of October, their luck seemed to change. Keep a lot on your paddle, lads. There's no prize beneath that sail. She's an English East Indian man. No a pirate or a Frenchie. To attack her would have been an act of piracy, but the crew were desperate. Not a penny earned in a year. Prize, man! Just sitting there waiting for the taking. Hey, are you with me, lads? Yeah! Bite your blaggers! For a lot of lawyers, we're pirate hunters! Not pirates. Do understand? Two thirds of them voted to attack, but Kid would not stand for it and forced the crew back under pistol. In the death of us, Kid. Death. So, did you stop the mutiny amongst the crew? In front of that day, aye. But they weren't with me now. They're all with that ringleader, gunner named of William Moore. Things came to a head a few days later when Kid the pirate hunter again refused to attack a merchant ship. No for us. Dutch. You be the ruin of us, sir. They could not ruin you! Oh. Died the next day that we... I wish I'd never set eyes on him. Yeah, I bet you had more than red wine on your hands after that, though, eh? What of it? On my ship, I am the law. And it was mutiny that he spoke. Mutiny! From that moment, Kidd, a lone figure against a desperate crew, began to crack. By mid-November, the pirate hunter had turned pirate, taking a Dutch-owned ship, the Ruperel. But his bad luck finally seemed to change when he spied the Quedda Merchant, a huge ship which ran up French colours, a legal prize at last. At least £100,000 in gold, fan cloth and jewels. A good prize for my men. And a fine profit to boot. Sadly, it was not quite as it seemed. As the crew went through the cargo, Kid found out the truth. She was no French ship, but Armenian, carrying a cargo owned by merchants much favoured in the court of the Grand Mogul. Oh, dear. I ran out French flags to trick her, and she tricked me back, raising French colours and showing me French papers. You'd be better off nicking the crown jewels. Aye. But I was in too deep now. You see, all those pearls and fine jewels coming aboard, my men, weren't going to hand them back now, were they? I suppose not, but you must have known that the Indian Emperor wouldn't be, you know, best pleased. Pleasing a man in a turban wasn't my mission. Pleasing four men back in England was. 
But your friends in England, especially the King, weren't as best pleased as they could have been, were they? I believe there was some who suddenly didn't want to care me, aye. It was little wonder that kids' backers wanted to wash their hands of him. Kids' taking of the Quedda merchant started a chain of events that ended in the Indian government locking up every Englishman in the subcontinent. The whole empire was in jail, and it was kids' fault. So what did Kid do? With the Quidda merchant sailing with him, he headed for the Isle de Saint-Marie, where he finally met a pirate by the name of Robert Culliford. With her 34 guns, the adventure galley should have been able to blast Culliford's ship out of the water, but it didn't happen. Gold in their pockets and mud in their brains. My men were no my men anymore. They wouldn't attack Culliford's ship, then? Attack it? Man, they were soon calling it theirs. What do you mean, they deserted you? Aye, all but twelve jumped ship and left me for that man Culliford. Pirates they were from head to toe, and I took their fair share of the prize with them too. In some ways, you can't blame the crew. The Isle de Saint-Marie, just to the north of Madagascar, was effectively run by an ex-buccaneer called Adam Baldridge, who made sure that any pirate ship was welcomed by unceasing amounts of wine, women and song. It was a kind of Ibiza of its day, and Kid's crew took full advantage of its delights, whilst Adam Baldridge emptied their pockets. No crew and little prize was all Kid had to show for four years at sea. He knew his backers would be after him not only for the cost of his ship, but £20,000 beyond. But money wasn't Kid's only problem. He was now fighting to clear his name. Kid sailed back to New York, stashing around 30,000 on an island in the Caribbean. A kind of bargaining chip. Pardon me, and you'll get your money. You might think he'd be mad going back to New York, but you'd be wrong. Certainly, some pirates were hanged from time to time, but some of them managed to swing a pardon. Especially if money happened to cross the palm of those in power. But in Kidd's case, he never really stood a chance. Apart from almost wrecking the beginnings of the British Empire, Kidd suffered from the fact that his backers, all powerful Whig lords, had fallen from power in the years that he'd been away. Let's face it, nobody wants to be a friend of the man who put the English East India Company in jail, and as a result, Kidd found he had no friends in New York and was soon on a boat back to England and a dark cell in Newgate Prison. Stinks in here. Yes, well, I'm sorry, but over there's the only place that I can shed. Well, that much is evident. I mean, why did you come back? You must know that we'd all let the fan. Well, I thought, you know, money and friends in high places, it might help mend a bridge or two. So they just took your money and banged you up? No, they just banged me up. Right up until the end, Kidd tried to gain a pardon, even writing to Parliament to try and get members of the House to go over to the West Indies and try and find the money that he'd buried. But a fat lot of good, that did him. Kidd had committed the wrong crime in the wrong place at the wrong time, and there was a rope with his name written on it. All he needed was a trial to get him acquainted with it. On the 8th of May, 1701, Kidd was charged with five counts of piracy plus one charge which came as a complete surprise to him. Captain William Kidd, you are charged with the murder of William Moore, gunner on the adventure merchant. Murder? 48 hours later, Kidd was found guilty and executed along with Darby Mullins, a member of his crew, and one of the few to actually remain faithful to him. They were marched to the gallows on the 23rd of May, 1701. As he was to be hanged by the Admiralty as a pirate, the gallows were built below the high tide mark, as was the tradition. It's said that Kidd was so drunk he could hardly stand. Come on, you. The executioner did his bit, tying his arms at the elbows before slipping the noose over his head. The priest, a Frenchman by the name of Paul Lorraine, led the condemned men in a prayer. 
Then came the moment of execution, but Kid did not die. The rope broke and Kid dropped into the mud where he lay watching the twitching body of his old crewmate Darby Mullins. Only when the twitching stopped was Kid led back up the ladder, this time to a stronger rope. After Kid was hanged, they cut him down and let the traditional three tides pass over his body before bringing him up onto the foreshore. Here, his body was given a liberal coating of tar and hung in a gibbet at Gravesend as a warning to other seamen not to become pirates. But why the tar? I can hear you cry. Well, you don't want seagulls pecking at him, do you? It's all for your own good, mate. But what about the treasure of the Quedda merchant? It was never found. That stash that old Captain Kidd is meant to have buried somewhere in the Caribbean? Well, every year there's some new bright spark who thinks they know where it is and sets off to the sunshine with a bucket and spade. But the truth is there's only one man who really knows. And he died over 300 years ago. One more swashbuckling adventure for Vic after the break on Discovery Channel. He's hanging out with highwayman Claude Duval in Rhodes Gallery next.